In this video, we're going to get our hands dirty with manipulating programs written in the programming language that we saw at a very high level used in the previous video, the one with all the instructions. That one we were just sort of using as a fuzzy example of a notional programming language. This time we're going to make it concrete with real code. So the code that I was showing you previously uh, maybe looked unfamiliar because it's a programming language that I invented just for 6120. Uh, the programming language is called Brill for the Big Red Intermediate Language. And that's what we're going to use for the first few months of uh, this course to sort of get our, to get familiar with manipulating programs without going uh, full scale on uh, and interacting with real world programming languages like C or using real compiler infrastructures like LLVM. Uh, this sort of provides a nice way that is indicative of how real world compilers work and pre presenting quite a bit of their complexity while, uh, while sort of sweeping under the carpet a bunch of the rough edges that make it hard to get started. Uh, the idea behind Brill is that it's a very, very simple and extremely regular intermediate language that's based on instructions that you can extend as much as you want to make it as interesting as you want. So it's not just a fixed language, you can add whatever extensions you want on top of it. So we'll start by playing around with the very core of the language, but there are existing extensions that make it more interesting, and you can, of course, add your own. The canonical home for everything related to Brill, which is the Big Red Intermediate Language, is here at this URL that you can find linked several places from the 6120 website. Uh, you'll also want to check out the GitHub repository that contains a kind of mono repository with a bunch of infrastructure and the documentation uh, related to Brill. So a mono repository means that there's a bunch of different tools in here, and they're all interrelated, even though they're kind of separate tools. Uh, but we're going to start out with uh, just sort of getting a feel for what this language is like. Let's get started by looking at a very simple example of a Brill program. One of the most important things about Brill is that the canonical representation is as a JSON document. JSON is just a serialization format. It's not all that interesting, but the point is that every single language out there has a built-in library, for the most part, for, uh, for parsing and emitting JSON files. So there is no canonical language that you need to use to process Brill programs. You don't need to write a parser. Remember, this class is definitively not about parsers. You just need to use a built-in JSON library in order to start processing Brill documents. You don't need to use any existing infrastructure. So the way that, that a Brill program works is that it starts out at the top level in a Brill program is just this dictionary that says, here are the functions that it contains. And then here is a dictionary that contains a definition of a single function. Uh, you'll see that there's a sort of a key value structure going on here. We have the name of the function. It has no arguments, but there is a list of instructions. So the instructions contain the body of the function, and each instruction in the body is just a JSON dictionary. So um, and this one has exactly four instructions. There's a constant instruction indicated by its op being const. There is a second one, and then there is an add instruction, and then finally a print instruction. These correspond to the much, much more readable and more human writable text format that we saw in the document in the previous video. I'll show you that one, that uh, text equivalent now. Here's the text equivalent of that same program. And I really want to emphasize that even though this is way more convenient for reading and writing, it is not the canonical representation of the Brill program. The text format is just an alternative representation that is fit for human foibles. The actual representation, the canonical one, is for computers, and that's the JSON representation. But you can see that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence going on here. The at symbol means that we're declaring a function, and then there are four instructions in the body. There's two constants, that add instruction, and finally the print instruction. Uh, it's very convenient to be able to read and write uh, programs in this format, but then to do anything interesting with them, we will translate them into the JSON representation and then do stuff from there. Load them up in whatever tool you like, transform it, and then emit it back as JSON. I have provided for you already a parser and emitter for this text format, which means that you never have to touch a, touch a parser in the entirety of 6120 in order to use Brill and to write interesting compilers. You just have to process the JSON representation. Next, we're going to get the Brill tools set up and start processing some programs. The first thing to do is to clone the repository. Then the next thing we're going to want to do is install a couple of the tools. There's In the documentation, you can see that there's a bunch of interesting tools that come with Brill, but the, a couple of them are more important than the others. 
Uh, in particular, the things we're going to want to use the most are the implementation of the text representation, that is the parser and emitter that go back and forth between JSON and the human readable form, and the interpreter, that is the thing that can actually execute the programs and tell you what they do. Super important. There is there are documentation about how to set up each of the tools in here, but there's also for those two most important tools, you can also see uh, setup instructions in the README. They are it's not hard at all. Um, the first thing is in the Brill TS directory that includes the interpreter. Um, also, a language definition in TypeScript if you want to use TypeScript to manipulate Braille programs. And then it also contains a very, very limited compiler from TypeScript into Braille, which makes it easier to write longer programs. Um, but the thing you need to do in here is uh, you'll need the yarn package manager. Um, you can also use npm if you know how to do that. In any case, you'll type yarn to install all the dependencies, yarn build to compile the TypeScript code. And then you can type yarn link. This adds to your path a program called Brill I for the Brill interpreter. This is something you can pipe Brill programs into in their JSON representation in order to run them. For example, there is a program in the test directory. Here's the add program we just saw before. If you pipe that into the Brill interpreter, it will run the program. And when it hits a print statement, it prints out the result. Uh, you notice that I used a less than in that previous command. Uh, that is to indicate that we're reading from the file and piping that into the interpreter. Uh, next, we'll want to set up the tools for the text format. So there's a, a directory called Brill Text here. Um, this this thing is written in Python. So we've already seen two different pro programming languages interacting with Brill programs. And again, this is part of the philosophy that you should be able to use any programming language and any set of tools you like in order to load up and manipulate and interpret Brill programs. Um, this, these ones are in Python. The previous ones are in TypeScript. Um, for this, you'll need a tool, uh, a package management tool for Python called, uh, called Flit, which you can install uh, in kind of the obvious way. Then you'll have a tool called Flit, which you can use then. Say Flit install, and then you, there's many different options for the Flit install command, but the ones that I recommend are symlink so that you can make changes to the text format if you want to, and then, um, or like pull updated changes in this Git repository, and they'll get reflected automatically, and then user just to install it without uh, super user permissions. Uh, then you will have tools, aside from the Brill interpreter, you'll now have two different tools called Brill to text. That takes JSON documentation, JSON representation of Brill programs, and dumps them out as human readable text and uh, the Braille to JSON, which is a parser that emits the JSON representation. I'll show you how to use those two things now. Uh, we can do Braille to text on the program we were just using before. So under test, add.json, um, that takes the JSON representation and dumps it out in the text format we just saw. The Braille to JSON thing does exactly the opposite. So in fact, we could take this thing um, that is currently a human readable representation and pipe this into Brill to JSON, and that should uh, print out the JSON representation. The nice thing about this then is that you can take this JSON representation and pipe it into the Brill interpreter if you want to actually run it. So using these Unix uh, command line shells, you can build up more and more interesting pipelines. For example, if you write an optimization or a transformation on these things, you can just uh, put this in between um, the the thing that emits JSON and the thing that runs the programs in the pipeline. So like my great transformation, if you wrote that thing and that was a command that was available, you could transform programs before feeding them into the interpreter. Your task for lesson two is to load up Braille programs and write some code that does something to them. It doesn't have to be that interesting. And in fact, it should be somewhat unambitious. unambitious. It's just to get you sort of familiar with the Braille ecosystem and to understand what it's like to process these programs. In the rest of this video, we're going to do some of that together. I'm going to get started, at least, drawing the control flow graph for, uh, for Braille programs. That is forming basic blocks, just like we did in the previous video. You are welcome to follow along. In fact, I encourage you to follow along. You don't have to follow the code exactly how I do it. Um, you can, again, use any language you want. I'm going to do this in Python, just because it makes it really easy to write like pseudocode-like processing algorithms. Um, but you uh, can use any tool you like. And if you do this CFG exercise, I think you'll learn a lot. And if you uh, think up one additional thing that you can do on top of this and turn that in for your uh, for your task for this week, then you'll be up and running with the with the uh, with the Brill ecosystem. Anyway, to get started, uh, 
I'm just going to start completely from scratch and make a, a CFJS character in Python. Let's do the normal boilerplate. I'm just going to have a function called my CFG, I guess, for now. And I know I'm going to need Python's JSON library in order to load up programs. Um, I'm also going to read them from the standard input, so I'll need sys. OK, we're almost there. We've almost loaded a Brill program. All I need to do now is just json.load sys.stidin. And now I have a program. Uh, just to make sure I'm doing everything right, I'm just going to print that out. So uh, we need a sort of an interesting program. There's a whole bunch of them in the test directory that come with the Braille repository. So for example, under test, uh, and the interpreter test has lots of things, like there's a jump test, for example. Uh, let's take a look at that one. This is a great program. It contains one jump. In any case, it should make for a like semi-interesting uh, control flow graph. Um, to use this, of course, we can't pipe this directly into our program because it's not in the JSON format. So the, what we'll need to do is run that Brill to JSON program and pipe in this uh, jump program that we were using. And now we'll pipe that into the MyCFG program. And then unsurprisingly, it just prints out the Python representation of that JSON. Great, cool. OK, we're uh, pretty much good. Um, so these programs can have multiple functions for this service that doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to loop over the functions in the program and then do something with them. I guess the first thing I'm going to need to do is form the blo blocks, form the basic blocks. So I'm going to uh, make a new function called form blocks. And I guess all it really needs is the insters from that. Call that the body of the function. I know I'm going to have to do something that like loops over the instructions in the body, but just to make sure that I'm doing this right, that's not right. Cool. So those are the instructions uh, in the body. And now we're going to uh, actually do our algorithm for forming the basic blocks. So as I recall from my algorithm, we had this thing called block, which here I'll name a uh, cur block. And that's going to start out empty, and we're going to loop over all of the blocks. And I guess I will use Python generators to yield uh, the current block as I build it up. Um, but I guess the point is that I need to terminate the block if I encounter a label or a terminator instruction. And otherwise, I need to add things to the current block. I think, that, I think we got that right. OK, so anyway, but I will, um, I think I, I guess the top level thing I need to do is distinguish between normal instructions, like actual instructions and labels that appear in this list. That is like we have uh, some maps that have a label thing in them, and then all instructions will have this like op uh, field in the dictionary. So I can distinguish between um, actual instructions and labels by doing this. And we'll do something here. So this this might be a label. Anyway, I have to do one thing in, in the case that it's a uh, an actual instruction, and another thing in case it's a label. So the way that it worked, I think, from our pseudocode is that, we, that if it's an actual instruction, then regardless of what it is, regardless of whether it's a terminator or not, we will want to take our current block and append the instruction. Um, so this is going to become a list of instructions, um, including the terminator for this block. And the point is that we now need to check for a, a terminator. Um, and the way we're going to do that is say uh, if the instructions opcode in, and then we need to figure out what our list of terminators is. I realized in the previous video that I made things sound a little bit too simple. I said that there that the only uh, two terminators should be um, jump and branch. But to answer questions like this, you shouldn't listen to me. You should go to the actual documentation for Brill. So let's flip over to the documentation here. The documentation has a section called the language reference. And the, the first one is not going to be very helpful for this uh, discussion, but it's going to be super helpful for like understanding the, the uh, structure of Braille programs. And it tells you what a program is, what a type is, what a function contains, all that stuff, like what fields exist on which objects. But what I really want to know is like what the actual available operations are. 
Um, and the way that the Braille documentation is organized is that there is a base set of operations and types that uh, make up the, the kind of the core of the Braille language. And then there are some extensions. So the core just contains uh, integers and booleans and things like adding and multiplying and these kind of uh, very, very basic operations. You can see that there's also an extension for dealing with, uh, with allocating and freeing and accessing memory, and then one for floating point, but we don't need those for now. We just need to look at the operations that are available in the base language. That's all we're processing for now. Um, and of course, the, all the, the terminators that we're going to have to worry about are going to be uh, control operators. So conveniently, there is a section in here called control that lists all the control operators. And these are the four that exist in the, uh, in the entire Braille language. There are jump and branch, as we saw before. Um, there is also call for function invocation. You can uh, you can call functions in Brill, which is a, a very very useful thing to do. Um, you can also return from functions. Here is a perhaps surprising thing. Generally speaking, instruction based IRs, the when you call functions, that is not considered a terminator for a basic block, even though it does involve in some way jumping out of the current basic block and executing some other instructions next. The reason is that the call will eventually return to that point in your basic block. So the kind of invariant we want to maintain about basic blocks is that uh, they that the uh, blocks execute in some way atomically. That is, like if one instruction executes, then they all execute. And that is still true of when you can have call instructions kind of mixed in in the middle, because you will be calling the function, but eventually you'll come back to that basic block and you'll finish the rest of the basic block. So generally speaking, call is not a terminator. However, the one that I left out was ret. That is, if you return from a function, that immediately stops the basic block, uh, that immediately stops the execution of the function, so it should also break up a basic blocks. So I guess the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to uh, like have a list at the top called terminators, which is just going to be a tuple of all the opcodes that I want to consider to be terminating instructions. So that has uh, not call, but jump and branch and return. And I will do something if the opcode for an instruction is in that list of terminators, that tuple of terminators. So I'll do something with that. Um, in particular, I need to, as the name implies, terminate the block. Um, but otherwise, I think that uh, we don't, yeah, we need to terminate the block, and I guess we need to start a new one. So the way I'll do that is that I'm going to use Python generators here. So I'll say, like, yield the current block. Um, that is, let the let the client uh, see that we have formed a complete basic block, and then I will set cur block to be a new empty fresh list for us to build up. OK, so I think that's all good for instructions. That is, like for terminators, we'll add them to the block first, and then we'll yield that completed block that has uh, now has an instruction at the end. So um, when we hit a label, we will want to end the current basic block. So I think that the, the easiest way to do this is just to say uh, yield uh, cur block just as uh, we did before. And for this version, it's going to be super useful to be able to like associate um, blocks with the labels that they start with. So I think that the way I want to do this is that when we finish a basic block, instead of just saying uh, cur block is the empty list, um, just like starting a new fresh one, I think I want to say that the, the next block starts with the label that we just hit. That is like, we just sort of finished the block, we hit a label. I would like to, to include the label at the start of the next basic block. And of course, labels aren't like actually part of the code that runs uh, those basic blocks, but it's going to be useful to have those labels sitting around so that we can still um, jump between blocks. So the way I'm going to do this is to put the instruction in the basic block. Uh, in the next basic block that we start. The last thing we need to do, which I almost forgot about, which is, the, is that we need to emit one last basic block. That is, if we're still forming a basic block and we get to the end of a function and there's not a control operator there, that is, there's no return, there's kind of an implicit return there that we need to consider at the end of the last basic block. So the last thing we need to do is yield cur block. And this at least is a good start. We can debug this in a second, um, but I will first just say that will print out the every block in the program. So this should be pretty simple for the program that we just saw. Hopefully this does something interesting. Looks like maybe it's, it's super helpful, I think, to look at the actual code in um, the 
to decide whether we have this right. That is to read the, the human readable text representation. So does it look like there should be three blocks? That is the first one that contains the constant and then the jump. The second one that just contains the constant. And then finally, the last one that we uh, are going to include the label and then uh, and then the print statement. Yes, OK, so I think this is right. I think that at least for this one, I think we have something that's working. Um, so great, we have our very first version of our basic block formation uh, algorithm. That's not a CFG. Uh, it's not a CFG extractor yet, but we do have our basic blocks. Now would be a great time to take it from here and give it your best shot at doing the rest of the algorithm. That is like taking this list of blocks and actually implementing the pseudocode that we developed together for forming an entire control flow graph. That is a bit something that represents the graph from blocks to blocks. That is the successor relation. That is like which basic blocks are uh, the destinations of jumps from other basic blocks. So feel free to pause the video and do that now. Um, Give it your best, see how far you can get into it. I'm sure that you'll run into some weird gnarly challenges um, and uh, then come back and uh, I will, I'll show you how I arrived at my solution. So in developing my solution, the first thing that I think we need is in addition to having this list of blocks, we're gonna need uh, a named map of blocks. So uh, my first tactic, and this is not the only way to do it, is to write a separate function that you might call the like block map function. And this is going to take a list of blocks, a sequence of blocks, and it's going to iterate over them and uh, create names for every block. And it's going to do that with the label that might exist at the top of the block. And if you don't have a label at the top of the block, it's going to invent a name for you. Um, so this way, we will have a kind of regular representation that like gives us a string way to refer to blocks when we're forming the CFG. So here's how this is going to work for me. I guess like the the uh, the I'm going to have like this out dictionary that's going to map again names to entire blocks, and then going to like, iterate over the blocks. Uh, and add them to this dictionary. So eventually I'm going to return this out. Um, so I guess there are two cases. I need to do I need to do something like out name equals block. But first I need to figure out what the name is for a given block. And there are two cases here. Either we have a label or we don't. So here's how to tell. That is like the block zero, that's the first instruction. Uh, we're going to see if that has a label key. If so, then the name is just going to be block zero label. Uh, and it occurs to me that we don't need to keep around the label anymore because it's kind of redundant in this representation. That is, so we just need the instructions that format the body of the block. So we can just say that the block is now block one to the end. This is Python syntax for uh, make a new list that is like the old one, except it skips the first element. Okay, so otherwise, then we don't have a label at the beginning. We're not going to do anything to the block. All the instructions are important. However, we do need a name. Uh, so we'll just make one up here. So like we could say just like B1 or whatever. You could just like sort of randomly create a, a number to go at the end here. Uh, one random idea that I have is that we could just get a number uh, from the length of the out map so far. So the first one will be B0, and then like eventually we will we will like every time we'll add something, this is this is guaranteed to be guaranteed to be unique because we're constantly adding to the out array. Okay, so I think this works. Let's find out together. Very suspenseful. Um, let's just do create this thing called name to block, and that's gonna be block map applied to forming blocks here. I'm just going to print out this name to block map. OK, fingers crossed. This is a little hard to read, but it looks like we have a block called B0, one called B1, and one called somewhere, which sounds about right. OK, so I think we have names for all our blocks. The next thing that we need to do is actually compute the successors for these blocks. We now have this name to block thing, and I think it's it, going to have to work by iterating over all of the blocks. So the blocks are in the values of the name to block map. So I'll just say 
for a block in name to block dot values. I thought better of it. I'm going to make a function called uh, get cfg, and this thing is going to. I guess I'll write a doc string for myself. Uh, given a name to block map. So this is going to produce a dictionary that maps uh, names of blocks to lists of names of blocks that are successors of the one on the left-hand side. I hope that makes sense. In any case, I'm going to do my loop here, and then call it down here. Eventually, I'm going to print out that CFG. All right. OK, so what I'm going to have to do for each block is find out what its successors are. That is, the thing that I'm producing is, again, this like output dictionary. And then we're going to eventually do like out, uh, I guess, I actually want to the name here. So now we have the name also of the, the um, block that we're processing. In any case, we need to do, we need somehow to produce a list of accessor successors of this block. Most blocks will only have one successor. Those with branches at the end will have two successors. But in any case, this is what we need to do. And eventually, we need to return out. OK, but we need to compute those successors. Everything that matters about computing the successors, we can think of by looking at the last instruction. That is, the last instruction might be a jump, or in which case, we know exactly what the successor is. Uh, or maybe it's a non-control operation, in which case, we know that the successor is the next block in the sequence. So I guess I'm just going to do that now. I'm going to take this like last item. Uh, that's block negative 1 um, in Python syntax. And we're going to do something with this. So I guess there's a few different cases. We can say, like, if we're going to have to do something if it is a jump. In fact, I think that we can, let, let's actually take a look at this, at the code. So in the JSON representation, jumps and branches use a key called labels that indicate the, the kind of, the, the labels that they are pointing to. So both the jump instruction and the branch instruction just give us the names of the, the blocks that are the successor of this block. So I think that this one, these two cases, we can probably handle the same way. That is like jump and branch. Uh, the successors are just, this is meant to be the last instruction, the last instructions labels. So I think that's all we need to do. And if that's the case, then those are the successors to this block. Uh, I hope I have that right. Um, the other case, another case we have to worry about is the is the other terminator. So if that last operation is return, then there are no labels that are argument to the return function. In fact, we can confirm that by looking at the documentation. The return function, it's just a ret. It doesn't have any arguments or anything. If it's a ret, then the successors are nothing. That is, this is an exit block. It doesn't have any out edges coming from it. Uh, but we're still not done, because there's a chance that this is a non-terminator instruction. That is, that we have to worry about the case where the block falls through to the next block, and that we don't have this convenience of just being able to get the label of the block for the uh, from the instruction that's the terminator. And we have a little bit of a problem, because now we need to ask the question, what is the next block from this block? And so far, we've just been maintaining a dictionary. So it's not really a well-posed question to ask, what is the next block after this one? So I'm going to take advantage of a little bit of a Python uh, magic to make this easier, which is that Python has a collection class called ordered dict that is guaranteed to maintain its order, which means that when we're building up this block map, we're not just going to be making an unstructured map. We're going to be making one that uh, that maintains the order that we inserted in. So we can ask the well-formed question, what is the next block now? If you're doing this in some language that doesn't have this like ordered dict thing, it might actually be cleaner not to. You can just emit an association list that is like just a key, a, a pairs of keys and values instead of using a dictionary. 
so that means that in this get CFG function, I now have the ability to, and this is not very elegant, I have to admit, to use Python's enumerate utility to look up the index of the current block that we're looking at. So now it's possible to ask, forgot this needs to take an argument. It's possible to ask like name to block dot items, uh, let's call it keys actually. So if we get a list of all the keys, uh, I would be the current one, we can get I plus one. So the successor to this block would just be uh, I plus one. So I know this is gonna be a problem if I'm at the last block already, but I'm just gonna give it a shot for now and it is almost certainly going to crash. In fact, maybe I would like to watch it crash when we have to deal with the last block. Yes, it's going to do this. Uh, it's going to crash when it hits the last thing. And of course that is out of range. So we can fix this. And again, this is really not terribly elegant, but we can just say, uh, There are no successors. It's just like having a return if you're at the very end. Otherwise, do what we were going to do anyway. Did this work? No. Maybe if you want to, you, you can debug my code by, uh, maybe you've already figured out the bug, but I now need to figure out what I'm doing here. Of course, this should be off by one. Great, so I think we kind of have a CFG here. That is like we named these blocks before. I guess it would be nice to print out. In fact, I'll print it out in a slightly nicer way. So it's easier to read. So we know we have these three blocks. They, they got these two invented names, B0 and B1, and then somewhere the successor of B0 is somewhere because it jumps there. The successor of B1 is somewhere because it falls through. And the successor of somewhere is nothing because it's the end of the function. Woohoo, I think we got a CFG. The next step is just for fun. I'm gonna draw these, uh, these CFGs as actual graphs using the GraphViz tool. If you've never used GraphViz, it's pretty cool. It uh, is just a way to like output a textual representation, get it turned into a nice little like visual graphic. It's not pretty, but it's super, super nice for getting a quick visualization out of compiler tools. So I'm going to do that uh, just using the uh, CFG that is like the successor map function that I had just emitted. Um, that's not going to be that hard. Um, fortunately, the the dot format that graph is uses is really, really simple. You just have to say like, digraph and then you give it a name and there's going to be like opening curly braces thanks to python formatting i gotta do that twice anyway i gotta say like uh gotta give this graph a name anyway just to sort of show you what that looks like uh i don't want to print this stuff anymore so yeah so we got this digraph mains we're going to print all the edges um So we're going to make one vertex per CFG node, per basic block. So we'll do, uh, we'll just do some annotation and print the, and add the name of the block. Um, I guess that's all we need, so we don't even need this stuff. So we'll just print the name of the block. Okay, great, cool. Now we will add the edges. The way that this will work is I'll just loop over the name to block map. So we'll get the name and the successors, the name of the current block and some successors, and name to block. And we will, uh, the syntax for doing this is just that you have one name of a previously declared vertex mapped to another name, and you can just put in, uh, I guess we need uh, to loop over the successors. That should do it. And finally, we just need a closing curly brace. And I think we should be all good. Um, this gives, that's not right at all. Of course, I meant to loop over CFG, not name to block. Hopefully this works. Okay, so we got declarations of the three vertices. And I think we also got just two edges, 
B0 to somewhere and B1 to somewhere, and I think that's it. So I think that this is a valid uh, graph viz graph. So we can just pipe that thing into .tpdf, oh, uh, cfg.pdf. I think this works. And we can view this wonderful control flow graph. Of course, the fact that this, this CFG extractor and graph drawer works on exactly one example should not be satisfying at all. In fact, it be, should be somewhat suspicious that there are probably issues going on with the rest of the language. That is, we've just done one tiny little example that doesn't even have more than one instruction per basic block most of the time. Uh, there are definitely bugs in this, I can tell you that. I uh, sort of skipped over a few cases that will certainly come up when we run this on more realistic programs. So the next thing I want to show to you is a convenient way to do testing. It's uh, not required that you use this at all in 6120, but it is what the rest of the Braille infrastructure uses. And uh, I'm going to show you that this tool for testing that you might find generally useful when writing small tools as part of a larger compiler. Uh, that tool is called Turnt. Turnt is a uh, testing tool, the tiny unified runner and tester that we made a couple of years ago that is super, super simple. All it does is run a command like say this command right here on several different files and then check that the output matches a pre-computed output on disk. So it's it, it, it doesn't do any like sort of, it, it doesn't work like unit tests. So you don't have to like write the expected, uh, write, write checks for what you expect your function to do. You instead just do the super simple thing, which is to like make sure that you match some pre-computed output. This is a really nice way to get most of the benefits of testing. That is like you can make a few changes and then run your program on a whole bunch of inputs to make sure nothing broke uh, while you're doing refactoring, for example, without a lot of the overhead of testing, the, the, of, of traditional unit testing. That is, you don't have to write these complicated specifications. Um, and this, uh, I just find in my experience, is a super, super useful way to go about gaining confidence that your implementation uh, for like these little compiler tasks actually works. Um, so I'm going to recommend that you explore this. It can be uh, useful just to get familiar with, even if you don't use it. Um, and I'm going to apply it to our little CFG extractor now. Uh, turnt is also a Python tool. Uh, you don't need to do anything fancy to install it. You can just do pip install turnt. Uh, I already have it installed. Um, do I? Apparently not. OK, now I got it. Great. Um, but in any case, it is the tool that is used in all of the uh, test infrastructure for Brill. So in that test directory that you saw before, that has a bunch of inputs. So for example, the interpreter uh, directory has a bunch of tests for the interpreter. It has this, uh, it has, let's see, it's got a divide uh, program. Um, and if you look at that, it's just a normal Braille program. And then uh, checked into the repository is an example, uh, is the output of that. That is like what the interpreter should print. And the key to working with turnt is that there is a config file called um, which is uh, just it indicates like what command we're supposed to run in this. And there's like other things that you can read about in the readme for turnt that you can put in the configuration file. But this is the soul of it. You just kind of like write down this command to say that like I'm going to run uh, I'm going to convert the input file, that's this one, dev.brill in this case, to JSON, and then uh, run the interpreter on it. And that's what's going to be captured in the out file. Super, super simple. And if we run turnt, we can uh, we can check that this is the case. So I actually, I just go over to the uh, interpreter directory. And if I just say turnt uh, div.brill, this will run those commands and say, OK, you do match exactly what's on the disk. A different thing that you will find super useful, a combination of flags, is the verbose and print uh, flags, which just say, um, I'm going to execute this command and just show you the output instead of comparing it to the expected output. So this is a nice way to, to not have to remember that you have to like put the less thans in the special place and the pipes in the special place in order to like run the command every time. This is just a way to like to have a reproducible way to run the same command on a whole bunch of different files. Like for example, there's another uh, that like, here that, well, that's surprising. But uh, other than that, <laughs> you can you can see that this makes it easy to run the, the same command on multiple files uh, just to observe the output while you're debugging. In any case, we're going to ignore that bug in the interpreter right now. I actually don't know what's going on. I think it's just an old version of the interpreter it's trying to run. Um, and we're going to flip back over to our uh, CFG example and uh, set up some testing infrastructure for it. So it's super simple. All you got to do is like have a test directory. You don't even need a directory if you don't want to. But in any case, you uh, can put in a 
um, you can put it put a, a file called uh, turnt.toml and uh, start typing your configuration. Again, there's a whole bunch of configuration options you can learn about in the readme for turnt, but the big thing you need to do is just say command and then type some command here. And then I'm gonna just scroll up and like look at the command that I was running before. I don't wanna actually feed it through dot exactly. I just wanna actually, I just wanna run the, um, I just wanna run our extractor to print the, um, print the graph is graph specification. And instead of hard coding a specific file name here, I will now just say, you just say brackets file name, that gets expanded to the file name of the current test. I will also need to change the path to the Python script that I'm running because now I'm under this test directory. Uh, these commands run in the directory where the file names are. So like this, where the test files are. So this will just be uh, jump.brill, for example, if we do that, and we'll need a relative path to the script we're actually trying to run. So the next thing we need is a file to actually run this on. I'll just start by copying over an existing test. Uh, so from the test directory, the interpreter tests, we had this great test we were using before. I'll copy it here. Um, we can run turnt on this immediately and will tell us that something is wrong because we don't have an expected output yet. Um, one of the flags to turnt is diff, which will tell you what's the difference between what is on disk and what we're out actually outputting. So this diff is indicating that there was nothing on disk and the um, and everything is being added. So uh, in order to like mark this as the correct output, it looks like the correct output to me. The last flag to turn that you want to use all the time is turn save. This save something to disk called jump.out. We can look at that. It is exactly the output we expected. And then finally, now, if we do turnt jump.brill, this says, okay, that is you match the correct output. And just to check that, that we're actually testing something meaningful, if I edit my CFG file and say like, uh, print something totally different, and I say turnt diff uh, jump.brill, I should now get a difference indicating exactly what changed. So as we improve the output or we make changes, it can be super useful to look at the diff to make sure that those are expected changes. And if so, we can do save to update the expected output for future runs. So I suppose uh, to make things a little bit more interesting, I will add a second test and I'll do that just by copying uh, jump.brill. I guess I'll say, just call this another test. Um, one thing that I would love to test is when um, we have more than one instruction up here. Or another thing I think would be great is to say that we have an explicit return at the end. And let's see what happens. Just to see the output, we can say uh, run another dot brill. And unsurprisingly, we have already found a bug. Maybe you can see what the bug is. I'll give you a few seconds to ponder. You got it exactly right. The bug here is that there is no block zero for one of the blocks. The particular block in question is the one that uh, that appears after the ret here. That is when we were forming basic blocks, we weren't careful enough to check whether there would be any instructions at all between a terminator and the uh, end of the function or the beginning of the next basic block. So it's actually gonna be a problem as well if we have a jump right before uh, another label. So we can fix that in uh, our script real quick just by saying we only are ever going to yield full blocks, uh, rather blocks with at least one instruction in. So we can just say if cur block, then yield that, and just do the same thing down here. And hopefully that fixes our problem. Hey, it works. Cool. So this looks like the right graph. We still have the same CFG despite those things that I added. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and save this as the expected output. Now we can run all the tests for the script by just saying turn star.brill and it will run both of them and tell them that everything's going okay. I encourage you to, once you have a CFG extractor or anything else working on Brill working, add a few more tests and keep expanding your test set as you uh, identify bugs, just add a new test that exercises that bug commit the output to your repository and build up a larger and larger set of tests. For example, in the main Brill directory at the root of the repository, there's a whole bunch of tests. You can just do a make tests to run the entire suite. And you can see that we've just been building these up over time. As we made small tweaks and found bugs, it's really easy to just add one more test. And pretty soon you have dozens and dozens of tests 
and you can be reasonably sure that you didn't break your code when you make small changes because you can easily check a very large number of inputs uh, to make sure that they're still doing the right thing. Uh, good luck, and I hope you enjoy using Turnt. Um, and please ask any questions you have at all about the Braille infrastructure. If you're confused about any of the documentation, um, please uh, post questions on Zulip.